From the past until now, what NASA accomplished on the moon was indeed an indelible milestone, a result that fills us all with pride and joy. They successfully sent astronauts to the lunar surface for the first time in history, allowing the U.S. to claim victory in the space race with the Soviet Union. However, to this day, the difficulty and struggles associated with returning to the moon have sparked skepticism among all of us. If we went to the moon in the 1960s, why has it taken so long to go back, especially when they had the assistance of SpaceX, the giant in the aerospace industry today. Where are the gaps in the Artemis mission that NASA and Starship don't want to tell us? Let's find out in today's episode of Alpha Tech. On the surface, organizations all want to convey big goals and projects that capture attention, ignite the imagination, and stir widespread excitement. However, this emphasis on spectacular end goals frequently comes at the expense of providing detailed explanations of how these feats will be achieved. Press releases, public statements, and promotional materials tend to highlight the visions and end results rather than the complex, boring, and sometimes arduous processes required to get us there. This approach, while while effective in maintaining public enthusiasm and support, leaves a significant gap in understanding for those more deeply interested in space missions. Space enthusiasts and experts who seek more than just the final picture often find themselves frustrated by the lack of transparency and detailed information. They want to know not just what will be done, but how it's going to be accomplished, including the specific technical, logistical, and engineering challenges involved. Indeed, there's no easy answer to NASA's challenges. But fundamentally, the gap in their lunar program that they are reluctant to disclose involves money, politics, and technique. These factors not only play a crucial role in shaping the mission, but also lead to issues in the technical development process required to execute that mission. The Artemis moon missions, while ambitious and inspiring, have faced several significant challenges from their inception. Historically, the Apollo missions were enormously successful, but enormously expensive. Accounting for inflation, the entire Apollo program would cost over $280 billion in today's dollars. However, NASA's significant budget increase disappeared in the 1970s when Richard Nixon cut NASA's budget by hundreds of millions of dollars, stating that it was no longer a special program. Like any other part of the government, human spaceflight would have to compete for resources. NASA's budget remained low for decades. Since then, the agency's crewed space missions have been in low Earth orbit about one thousandth of the distance to the moon, like traveling a few blocks instead of going across the country. During President George W. Bush's tenure, the goal of returning humans to the moon was revived with NASA's Constellation Project, which was far larger in scale than the Apollo missions. However, the program was canceled by the Obama administration in 2010 due to budget overruns accounting to billions of dollars, years of delays, and uncertainty about the expected levels of success. It wasn't until the time of President Donald Trump and Vice President Mike Pence who made lunar exploration a national priority that significant progress was made. They set an aggressive timeline mandating that NASA land astronauts on the moon by 2024. This abrupt shift in focus and the tight deadline placed immense pressure on NASA to hastily formulate a viable plan. This time, NASA could no longer land on the moon on its own. It did not intend to do so alone. NASA not only collaborated with government-funded manufacturing agencies, but also contracted private companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin to develop vehicles for their brand new Artemis program. Let's first discuss NASA's primary vehicle. The Space Launch System, or SLS for short, is a super heavy lift launch vehicle intended to carry astronauts and cargo to lunar orbit. However, the SLS faced substantial challenges from the outset. The design concepts for the SLS were largely recycled from previous administrations, particularly from the Space Shuttle and Constellation programs. This reliance on older designs was driven by the need to expedite development and reduce costs, but it also meant that the SLS was saddled with outdated technology and limitations. One of the most critical limitations of the SLS is its inability to land on the moon. While SLS can carry astronauts to a high lunar orbit, the spacecraft cannot descend to the lunar surface and come back. This gap in functionality required NASA to rely on external private companies to develop a lunar lander capable of completing the mission. Moreover, the SLS's power constraints prevent it from sending crew modules into lower, more stable lunar orbits. Instead, the Artemis mission plans to use a near-rectilinear halo orbit NRHO, which only brings the crew module close to the moon once every six days. NRHO provides a narrow window for critical operations such as landing efforts in return. If any operation fails or conditions aren't optimal, astronauts have to wait several days for the next chance, causing significant delays and increasing mission risk. This choice was made partly due to communication advantages, but primarily because the SLS does not have enough fuel to achieve and sustain a lower orbit. Is there a way to fix this? Essentially, there's no way to fix it because the SLS is an old engineering project. Changing and upgrading it would disrupt its functionality, potentially causing more delays and more costs. For this reason, NASA has called for cooperation with private companies to produce lander vehicles. 
Among the competitors, SpaceX emerged as the winner with its ambitious Starship design. Despite being in the early stages of development and facing numerous technical challenges, Starship was selected for its potential to revolutionize space travel. Its promise of high capacity and reusability was compelling, even though the design was still largely conceptual at the time of selection. This choice underscored NASA's willingness to take calculated risks in pursuit of groundbreaking advancements in lunar exploration. However, SpaceX's Starship comes with its own set of challenges. One of the most complex aspects of the Starship mission profile is its orbital refueling requirement. Unlike conventional missions, where a single launch vehicle carries all the necessary fuel, Starship's journey to the moon necessitates multiple orbital refueling operations. This process involves launching several additional Starship vehicles, each filled with propellant to rendezvous and transfer fuel to the primary lunar-bound spacecraft in low-Earth orbit. The logistics of this operation are daunting. Each refueling mission must be precisely timed and executed to ensure the seamless transfer of cryogenic propellant, which must be kept at extremely low temperatures to stay in a liquid state. The Starship itself needs a complete refill, requiring about a thousand metric tons of propellant. Given that each refueling Starship can carry approximately a hundred metric tons, at least ten additional launches are needed solely for refueling purposes. Including the primary Starship and the gas station ship, the total number of launchers required for a single lunar mission could be more than 12. If we want to reduce that number of launches, we'll need to wait for the V3 version with the ability to carry more than 200 tons into orbit. Furthermore, this complex refueling operation must be replicated perfectly to ensure mission success. Any failure in the refueling chain could jeopardize the whole mission. The requirement for multiple launches not only increases the mission's complexity, but also its cost and risk. Each launch must be meticulously planned and executed, with no room for error. Despite the successes and lessons learned by SpaceX over the years, I must say that these are factors that NASA and SpaceX are still continuing to grapple with. However, these issues are highly likely to get resolved because SpaceX is handling them, and given their past achievements, there's no reason to believe they won't manage these problems. The key point here is the time and priority of government agencies. If government agencies can support SpaceX in conducting more launches, the future where Starship can accomplish everything is not far off. At that point, SpaceX might even be able to fly to the moon without the need for the SLS. Returning to the present, world powers are also advancing in the lunar race. Besides the successful moon landings by India and Japan, China is also preparing itself, together with several other countries including Russia, to develop a lunar base for humans called the International Lunar Research Station ILRS. Beijing and its partners will also include private sector players and governmental and non-governmental organizations with an organizational scheme that's a first. The Chinese program's first human missions to the lunar surface are expected by 2030. Among the sites where they want to land is the moon's south pole. NASA also wants to land there, but a few of Beijing's choices are in overlap with the locations selected for Artemis. The South Pole is a target for both the U.S. and China because countries want to extract the water ice that's hidden in craters there. This water could be used for life support at lunar bases and to make rocket fuel, helping bring down the cost of space exploration. Space programs are never on time, and postponements are normal. Space agencies are more cautious nowadays, even more than before, because a few tragedies we experienced in the past are obliging them to think way more carefully before launching humans into space. The safety of the crew is mandatory, and it always needs to be first priority. So if this is the reason why we have to wait a bit more before human beings after decades will walk on the moon again, I'm happy to wait. Going to space has never been easy, as demonstrated by several uncrewed missions to the moon over the last 12 months, both governmental and commercial, which didn't make it. But perhaps we should fail now while we're preparing for the new phase of humanity's history. The moon will soon experience human beings on its surface again, working and living regularly. But when humans go back there, this time it'll be to stay. That's all for today's episode. Thanks so much for watching and see you next time.